All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. So it's my pleasure to be here with all of you today. I'm your moderator for the program. My name is Paul Henderson. I work in our illustrious mayor's office. That's Mayor Edwin Lee. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce you to a number of people uh, that you may know already, but you'll be hearing from today. And I'm going to start with welcoming uh, Provost Dr. Sue Rosser. Thank you so much. As he said, I'm Sue Rosser, the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at San Francisco State University. On behalf of President Wong, who is in Washington, D.C. today advocating for public education, I want to offer you our warmest and most enthusiastic welcome. Welcome, everyone. We're happy to have you here. Congressman John Lewis, you are a hero for all of us at San Francisco State, and you are certainly a personal hero of mine, especially because I moved to San Francisco after 10 years in Atlanta, Georgia, where it was really clear the huge impact you have made on everyone's lives on a daily basis. San Francisco State has a history of participation in the civil rights and other social justice movements, including their values in the curriculum, research, and community partnerships that we offer. For these reasons and more, on behalf of the president and our whole university, I wish to convey to you how honored we are to have you at San Francisco State. And now I would like to read a few words for President Wong in his absence to welcome you. And these, this is President Wong speaking. Just imagine that I'm channeling him. <laughs> I regret not being able to join all of you at today's event to express in person my deep respect and admiration for one of my heroes Representative John Lewis. San Francisco State University is honored to welcome you today. While this may be your first visit to our campus, I can assure you that your commitment to social justice and equity have inspired countless San Francisco State students, faculty, and staff for decades. Your incredible life journey serves as an inspirational lesson for our students. You both shaped and witnessed history, including playing a leadership role in organizing the March on Washington in 1963, sharing the same podium that Dr. King used to deliver the I Have a Dream speech. And you joined President Barack Obama at his inauguration. You have truly lived in interesting times. But you have done so much more than live in these times. The progress of civil rights in the United States is a direct result of your early and complete commitment to leading the movement for civil rights. It includes having the tremendous courage to be one of the original freedom riders, embracing nonviolence in the face of extreme brutality. Your courage exposed the indignity and injustice of racism. And as a young man, no older than many of the students here today, you were one of just a few people of influence devoted to holding everyone in government accountable, even a Democratic president. San Francisco State is proud of its social justice legacy, born out of the courageous student strike of 1968 led by the Black Student Union. The face of public higher education 
I think we have some of the people from the original strike here today. Could those folks stand up for us? Yes, hey, how about that? Thank you for being here today and for what you did in 1968. The face of public higher education was changed here with the creation of the first black studies department and the first and only freestanding college of ethnic studies. <laughs> Today, our students remain deeply engaged in their communities, and they are a force for equity, justice, and resilience in their communities. Thank you, Representative Lewis, for spending time with our students, faculty, and staff. Our shared history suggests that it will be a fruitful collaboration. Welcome. So we have history in the audience, and we have history that we're about to bring to the stage. So without further ado, I present to you Congressman, civil rights advocate, author, John Lewis, and author, Andrew Light Aiden. How you doing? That's you. To welcome you, I'd like to bring to the stage Ms. Phoebe Dye, who is president of the Associated Students here for San Francisco State University. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Phoebe Dye, and I have the great privilege of serving as the president of Associated Students here at San Francisco State University. Today we are honored to have Congressman Lewis, one of the historical eight starters of the civil rights movement, an advocate for student activism as a former chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and an individual who has dedicated and risked his life for the protection of human rights here with us. On this campus, we have a strong culture, repu reputation, and history of activism. The 1968 student-led strike that laid the groundwork in establishing our ethnic studies department was key in defining our campus's core values of equity and social justice. We believe that student voices must be heard and that we have a duty to advocate for the things that truly matter. Here at SFSU, the students don't settle for the status quo. We stand up for what we believe in and fight to make a positive and lasting change in this world. With the growing difficulty of access to education due to budget cuts, each year our students take to the Capitol and lobby our representatives to invest in higher education. Here at SF State, there is an ongoing effort to empower and protect all people regardless of their gender or gender identity, from sex discrimination, including sexual harassment and violence through our Title IX and Gender Equity Committees. In 2013, we became the first public university on the West Coast to divest from fossil fuel-related investments and continues to lead the CSU in our sustainability efforts. For these reasons, it is utterly fitting that we have you here today with us, Congressman Lewis. So thank you for your presence in our beloved and active community. I'd like to bring up now for our opening remarks, the amazing Cheryl Davis, who is the director of MoMagic. Thanks, Carl. I appreciate it. 
So I know that um, we're starting a little bit late, so I'm actually going to move really quickly through the remarks. I want to bring up Hydra Mendoza, the mayor's um, education advisor and, and member of the Board of Education. I do just want to give a couple of recognitions out. I see Reverend Brown um, in the audience. I wanted to make sure to recognize who's here, Reverend Townsend, EOC, which has helped support getting books to all the students that are here today. Um, I also wanted to recognize Kimberly Brandon, who was one of the people that said, let's do this. Let's make sure we get the books in the hands of you young people and to get the congressman and Andrew out today. So um, as an alum of San Francisco State University, I'm so proud to have students here. This is where I had my turning point around history, and I'm really hoping that the young people here today will recognize the history and the, the awesome opportunity that you have and not wait till you're a third year college student to figure it out. So without that, without more, I'll give it to Hydra. Good afternoon. Thank you. I know we're standing between you and hearing this amazing speaker. But on behalf of Merrily, first of all, I want to thank San Francisco State for having us here. We have 400 of our San Francisco Unified School District students in the audience today. And we couldn't be more happy. Uh, on behalf of Merrily and San Francisco Unified School District, and I have several of our board members here, so uh, Commissioner Joe Wins, Commissioner Shimon Walton was here, and, and Commissioner Matt Haney. Um, we're thrilled and honored to be here with all of you and with one of our great leaders, Congressman John Lewis. You have this unique and exciting opportunity not only to be in the presence of someone who has been on the front lines of the civil rights movement, but someone who's been changing the face of federal policymakers for many, many decades. What makes the Congressman's presence so powerful is not only the great work he's done over the many years, but the age in which he took on many of our country's struggles that has cleared the pathway for so many of us. We often say in order to set the course for the future, we must know our past. We have so many hopes and dreams for our young people. And so having you present here today to gain the wisdom from Congressman Lewis is an opportunity to learn more about our past as you become our future leaders. The mayor and Congressman Lewis had breakfast this morning and the mayor wanted to personally thank Congressman Lewis for all of his sacrifices and his commitment to our future's young people. The mayor shared his own commitment to education through our very close partnerships with all of our public education institutions here in San Francisco. His youth jobs initiatives that connected over 7,600 youth to job opportunities and experiences just last summer alone. And his commitment to 21st century learning through math and technology through our middle school's leadership initiative and close partnership with Salesforce.com Foundation, whose founder, Mark Benioff, donated the congressman's books, which our students will be receiving today. And he was also helpful in making sure that 10,000 of our students got to see the movie Selma for free. So Congressman Lewis and Andrew, thank you both so much for being here on behalf of Mayor Lee and the 57,000 students in San Francisco Unified School District. Welcome to our great city of San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you, Hydra. I'd like to bring up a special performance now. And so to the stage, I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to Shanaka Hodge. It's all right with y'all if you do a poem? Can you hear me if I do it like this? Glad I asked. That's why, that's why you ask important questions. You get important answers. This is for the students. How y'all doing? I got this bulletproof dress, and yes, I've been wearing it. My mama rocked it first, suppose it is inherited. All of my apparel is crafted this way. I got this sick, sick sense of premonition, and hey, bet you notice in my posture way I open with an ostatarde on my way out. Hope you get your spray out. Never see me splayed out. I duck faster. No master come gunning for me. He test eye, rest eyes open watching the scene. 
But I won't be caught dead, rather live it up free. But the weight of this dress has been weighing on me, and it's hard to move softly in an iron fatigue, meaning I run fatigues, mean I'm creased at the seams, mean I'm beasting with dreams, mean I'm boasting of things broken when I'm coaxed off my dean, and it's so hard to focus when I'm slow in my dreams. And it's scope elongated when I post on the scene. I mean, every black girl, every one, even me, been pinched, poked, prodded, and sold on the cheap. It's part of a process, part of what haunts her. Mucks up the rhyme scheme, makes her a monster, harder to breathe, harder to speak, sorry to beat drop, but sometimes there is no meter, just repeating lines, just consecutive sentences like the ones being served by the boys I grew up with. They are turning men behind four inches of glass in this poem. I'm walking with my feet turned inward and the gate of my stalking grows short and uh, unfinished because uh, ever since he made me touch it, the words don't come like they used to and I don't blame anybody but myself, but I don't feel like talking about it. I feel like sitting at the back of the bus, eating sunflower seeds, cursing somebody out, controlling something, something, anything besides this dress masquerading as my body it seems so steel these days no chest to fear fear these days I don't die I am told I multiply but the school say I can't act right so forget trying to act right struck by the black knight of my own depression unmedicated undiagnosed bipolar like low and north pole like arms and elbows turf dancing around poor education and substandard air quality has made me expectant of death they say the girls from West Oakland got no self-respect but it's all I have left I invest in a dress that protects all my best and sometimes I miss love while dodging the drama it's 10 to my knees in this bulletproof armor. Good morning. All right, that was outstanding, outstanding. Thank you, thank you. All right, and now we have a brief presentation before we hear from Congressman himself. So I'd ask you to keep your attention as we bring up Sarah Williams, who will be accompanied by Prince Damond. Is it Damon's? Of course.
Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Williams and Prince Damond. All right, I'm gonna try and keep us on time here and I've made everyone wait long enough. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the living legend that we have with us here today. Author, civil rights leader, Congressman John Lewis. Madam Provost, members of the faculty, elected officials, my friend Reverend Brown, wonderful students at this great university. To be here in, in this great city at this great university I must tell you that I'm delighted, very happy, and very pleased to be here. To be here with my co-author, Andrew Iden, who started me on this journey, and he would tell you more. Paul, I want to thank you. I want to thank all of the individuals who helped make this happen, to come here. This is a beautiful city. It's a wonderful and beautiful state. Again, I remember the struggle here in 1968. Thank those of you that are here today that was here then and for finding a way to get in the way. I want to leave enough time for Andrew Iden to tell the story, the real story, how March Book One and Book Two came about. It's part of my story. You know, we just heard an unbelievable song. Thank you for the music. I love music. I don't know how many of you saw me doing the, the happy dance. <laughs> yeah, that song, Happy. But, uh, if it hadn't been for music, civil rights, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. Music created this sense of solidarity. It brought us together. When we were being beaten, arrested in jail, in jail sometime, in the state penitentiary in Mississippi, we were singing songs. So I'm happy to just be here. You know, in a few days from now, we're gonna celebrate and commemorate the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, the march from Selma uh, to Montgomery. Now I wanna make it plain that I didn't grow up in a big city like this city, of San Francisco or Los Angeles or San Diego. I grew up on a farm in rural Alabama, about 50 miles from Montgomery, a three-hour drive from Atlanta. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer, and I remember working in the field, picking cotton, gathering peanuts, pulling corn, and sometime I would fall behind and my mother would say, boy, you need to catch up and stop talking so much. And uh, I would say, this work is about to kill me. And she would say, boy, hard work never killed anybody. I said, well, it's about to kill me. <laughs> and when we would visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, or Birmingham, I saw those signs that said, white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, can you hear? So I should stay in one place, huh? Stay in my place, stay in my lane. I would come home and ask why. Why? And they would say, that's the way it is. 
Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. I didn't like segregation. I didn't like those signs. I didn't like the fact that we were bus past white schools to attend overcrowded African-American schools. I didn't like being told that I had to drink out of water fountain that said color. I didn't like the fact that we had to go up to something upstairs to the balcony, and some people call it the, butter, the buzzard roost, to see a movie. I didn't like it, but I didn't know what to do about it. But in 1955, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on all radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Dr. King inspired me to find a way to get in the way, to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble, and I've been getting in trouble ever since. I was so inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. that in 1956, 16 years old, with some of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we went down to the public library in the little town of Troy, Alabama, trying to check out some books, trying to get library cards, and we were told that the library was for whites only and not for coloreds. I never went back to that library until July 5th, 1998 for a book signing of my book, Walking with the Wind. And hundreds of blacks and white citizens showed up. We had a little reception, something to eat, something to drink, signed quite a few books. The end of the program, they gave me a library card. <laughs> if someone had told me then that as a member of Congress, that I would be back in that library signing books and getting a library card, I would say, you crazy? You out of your mind? You don't know what you're talking about? I want to say to the students and the young people here that you must never, ever lose hope. Or give up. You have to keep the faith and keep your eyes on the prize. When I finished high school in May of 1957, at the age of 17, I wanted to attend a little college only 10 miles from my home called Troy State College. Now it's known as Troy University. Submitting my application, my high school transcript, I never heard a word from the college. I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I didn't tell my mother, my father, any of my sisters or brothers, didn't tell any of my teachers. Just wrote a letter to Dr. King and told him I needed his help. Martin Luther King, Jr. wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. In the meantime, I had been accepted at a little college in Nashville, Tennessee. I remember so well. Didn't have much money. It was a school where I could go and work in the kitchen, serving food, or being a janitor to pay my way through school. My uncle of mine gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had. Gave me a foot locker, one of these big upright trunks. I put everything that I own in that foot locker except those chickens that I had been preaching to. And took a trip to Nashville. And after being in a city of Nashville for about three weeks, I told one of my teachers, a young minister by the name of Kelly Miller Smith, who was a colleague and friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that I've been in contact with Dr. King. 
He informed Martin Luther King Jr. that I was in Nashville in school. Dr. King got back in touch with me and suggested that when I was home for spring break to come and see him. So on a Saturday morning in March 1958, by this time I'm 18 years old, I boarded the bus and traveled 50 miles from Troy to Montgomery. And a young lawyer by the name of Fred Gray, who's played in the movie Selma, been a lawyer for Rosa Parks and for Dr. King during the Montgomery bus boycott, and became our lawyer during the Freedom Rides and during the march from Selma to Montgomery, met me at the Greyhound bus station and drove me to the First Baptist Church, passed by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, a colleague of Dr. King in the movement, and ushered me in to the office of the church, the pastor study. And I saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy standing behind a desk. I was so scared. I didn't know what to say or what to do. And Dr. King said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave my whole name. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my involvement. Meeting Martin Luther King Jr., meeting Ralph Abernathy, meeting Fred Gray, changed my life forever and set me on a path and have not looked back since. I continued to study in Nashville. My family, my mother and father were so afraid that something could happen to me, that they would lose the land, our house would be bombed or burned. So I continued to study in, in Nashville. They didn't have the money to file a suit against the state of Alabama or Troy State, not Troy University, or the State Board of Education. And so I continued to study there. And it was there in Nashville that we studied the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. We studied what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was all about in Montgomery. We studied Gandhi, what he accomplished in India. We studied Thoreau and civil disobedience. Students from Fish University American Baptist College, Tennessee State, Mahara Medical School from Vanderbilt and Peabody came together. Every Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m., we met at the Little Methodist Church where we had role playing and social drama. And then we started test sit-ins. And after the students started sitting in on a regular basis in North Carolina, we started sitting in on a regular basis in Nashville. And it was in Nashville, you'd be sitting there in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, waiting to be served, and someone come up and spit on you, put a lighted cigarette out in your hair or down your backs, pour hot water, hot coffee, hot chocolate on you, and you look straight ahead. And I've been told, as I told you before, don't get in trouble, but I continue to get in trouble necessary trouble. We were threatened with arrest and they tried to frighten us. But we used to sing the song, scatter your jail. Oh, old Wallace, you never can jail us all. The first time I got arrested, I felt free. I felt liberated. So during the 60s, I was arrested and jailed 40 times. And since I've been in Congress, I've been jailed five more times. And I'm probably going to get arrested and go to jail again. As a matter of fact, this young man here on my staff, I won't tell on him, but it's OK. We're doing some research. And he came up with. Uh, a photograph, he located a photograph of mine on the front page of the Nashville, Tennessee, where I was being arrested for the first time on February the 27th, 1960. Two or three days earlier, we had heard that we may be arrested. I wanted, if I were going to go to jail, I wanted to look, I guess you call it cool or 
clean. I didn't have any money, but I went downtown Nashville to a used men's store and bought a suit, a used suit. I paid $5 for it. I wish I still had that suit. Andrew said that I could sell it on eBay. <laughs> but I looked good in it. I really did. The point I want to make here, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to get in the way, to sail out there into the deep. Stand up, speak up. Speak out for what is right, for what is fair, for what is just. You have a moral obligation, a mandate, and a mission not to be silent. You cannot afford to be silent. Yeah. It would be, it would be, it would be our young people, our children, to have saved this little piece of real estate, this little piece of the planet. Not just for us, but for generation yet unborn. Just think a few short years ago, when hundreds of people came from California to the South to go on the Freedom Rides, to march in Selma, to march on Washington, to participate in the Mississippi Summer Project for the right to vote. Just a few short years ago, people were asked to count the number of bubbles on a bar of soap, the number of jelly beans on a jar. There were African-American professors, lawyers, and doctors, teachers, high school principals were told they could not read or write well enough that they could not interpret some section of the Constitution of the state of Alabama or Georgia or Mississippi. The state of Mississippi in 1964, 65, had a black voting age population of more than 450,000 and only about 16,000 blacks are registered to vote. One county in Alabama, Lowndes County between Selma and Montgomery, the county was more than 80% African American but there was not a single registered African-American voter in the county. In the city of Selma in Dallas County, with more than 15,000 African-Americans of voting age, and only 156 were registered to vote. We had to change it. When I spoke at the march on Washington on August 28, 1963, while I was working on this speech, I saw a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So at the march on Washington on August 28, 1963, I said, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too. It must be ours. The right to vote is precious. It is almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have in a democratic society, and we must use it. And I said to the students and the young people here, and to all of us, we must get out and vote like we never voted before, because they're forced to try to take it away and take us back. But we've come too far, we've made too much progress, and we're not going back, we're going forward. People died for the right to vote. I gave a little blood on that bridge. But three young men that I knew and met, I met and I knew these three young men. Andy Goodman, Nicka Schreiner, and James Shaney. These, these three young brothers, two whites and one African American, they didn't die in Vietnam. They didn't die in the Middle East. They didn't die in Eastern Europe. They didn't die in Central or South America. They didn't die in Africa. They died right here in our own country, trying to get all of our citizens to become participants in the democratic process. 
I want to tell you, we come a distance. We made a lot of progress, and for people who said to me sometime, Andrew, nothing had changed. I feel like saying, come and walk in my shoes, and I will show you change. The signs that I saw growing up, they said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting, those signs are gone, and they will not return. The only place that our children will see those signs will be in a book, in a museum, or on a video. That's progress. But there's still too many people in our country are left out and left behind. We can do better, and we must do better. <laughs> the last time I got arrested, it was around comprehensive immigration reform. It's a shame, and it is a disgrace that the Congress has not had the will to pass comprehensive immigration reform and set hundreds and thousands and millions of people on a path to citizenship. We must do it, and you must apply the pressure. So don't be quiet. Make some noise. Now, I want to just sort of close by saying, in March, book two, even in book one, we try to make it plain. It's a lot of drama. It's not just the arrest, but how people were treated, our fellow human beings. We don't want to go back there. We want to use what happened to encourage people to move on, to remember the past, remember our history. But I'm often, I often think about when President Barack Obama won the election in 08, I was standing in the pulpit of the new church, Ebenezer, in Atlanta, speaking to a group. And I looked at the corner of my eye and saw the television screen. That's, Ohio, Pennsylvania had gone for the president, for Obama. I jumped so high, I didn't think my feet were going to touch the ground. I touched the floor. And I started crying. And two well-known uh, reporters, one anchor man said to me, John, we noticed you were crying so much the night of the election. Why were you crying so much? I said, it was tears of joy, tears of happiness. They said, what are you going to do when he's inaugurated? I said, if I have any tears left, I'm going to cry some more. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> so if it hadn't been for Selma, I know many of you have seen the movie, and been for the marching feet of people, for those people who gave their life, those people that gave a little time, their resources, we wouldn't be where we are today, and there would be no Barack Obama as President of the United States of America. So we come that far, but one day, one day, one of you young students, one of you young women, not just young men, can be governor of the state, mayor of the city, a member of the House of Representatives, a member of the United States Senate, president of the United States of America. So don't give up. Don't give in. Keep the faith. Keep your eyes on the prize and keep moving like Dr. King would say, we on the move now, so let's keep moving. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So, who wants to follow that? <laughs> My name is Andrew Iden, and I serve on the congressman's staff, and I'm the co-author of his graphic novel, March. I was raised by a single mother in Atlanta. The congressman's been my congressman since I was three. When I was a kid, I turned to comics shortly after my father died, or my father left, because he, uh, I was looking for a place where there was justice, right? There was some, something right in the world. Somebody wanted to do something other than for self-motivation. They wanted there to be justice. And so all my life, I was reading comics. I moved on from the sort of white power fantasies of Captain America and into independent comics, and where there were people who were a little bit more like me, where my dad was off the boat and my mother was struggling to get by. And so for me to end up working for my congressman is one of those things that my mother really still scratches her head at. And then when I started writing a graphic novels with him, she really, she didn't know what she did right, and I told her it was because she worked hard, and that's the only reason I'm here. So you might be asking yourself, why did John Lewis write a graphic novel? And that's a fair question. It started in 2008. I was his congressman's press secretary on his campaign. I was coming down to the end of the campaign, and we were talking about what we were going to do after. Some people were going to go to the beach. Some people were going to go see their parents. And I freely admitted I was going to a comic book convention. Any of you guys been to a comic book convention? Yeah. See, let it out. It's OK. We're cool now. <laughs> and you can imagine the reaction I got where most of the staff started laughing at me. It's OK to be laughed at. You end up up here. <laughs> because from the back of the room, I heard a deep voice. It was Congressman Lewis saying, don't laugh. There was a comic book during the Civil Rights Movement and it was incredibly influential. It was called Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. And I later went on to write my grad thesis on it, right? Again, try getting your grad professor to let you write your thesis on a comic book. It was at Georgetown, so they really scratched their head. But what I learned was that the comic book was used in the South to help inspire some of the earliest acts of civil disobedience. It was used in South Africa to fight apartheid. It was banned by the South African government for being incendiary. It was used here in, in Southern California as part of the workers' rights movement. It was used in South America. It was used in Vietnam. And most recently, it was used in Tahrir Square as part of the Arab Spring. It was used to inspire change all over the world. And so it didn't seem like such an outside-the-box proposal when I said, John Lewis, why don't you write a comic book? And at first, he said, oh, maybe. We're talking about the first member of Congress ever to write a graphic novel. But I kept asking. I kept saying, Congressman, we need to inspire this generation. He said, I know. I said, so why don't we write a comic book? He said, well, maybe. And I asked. And finally, he turned around, surprised me, looked me dead in the eye, and said, OK, let's do it. But only if you write it with me. And that moment changed my life. There were some really bizarre moments of surreal uh, encounters on this journey. I went on the pilgrimage with the congressman where he le takes members of Congress back to the sacred sites in Alabama. And I get into an elevator, and lo and behold, there's John Siegenthaler and Ethel Kennedy. John Siegenthaler was the publisher of the Nashville Tennessean and an aide to Robert Kennedy. And Ethel Kennedy was Robert Kennedy's widow. And I, I was pretty young. I didn't know any better. And I said, excuse me, I just thought you might want to know. Y'all are in a comic book that I'm working on <laughs> with John Lewis. And Ethel looks up at me and she says, oh, well, that's nice, dear. <laughs> so you can understand what a thrill it was a few years later when she called me on my cell phone to tell me that March, book one, was the first graphic novel ever to receive a Robert F. Kennedy Book Award. <laughs> but that wasn't the moment where we knew these graphic novels were going to help us change this country. That moment came about two weeks before book one came out. And I got a phone call from a conservative reporter, or excuse me, let's put it this a different way, a reporter at a conservative newspaper that shall remain nameless. And he said, look, I don't usually do this, but I gave your book to my nine-year-old son. And he read it, and now he's put on his Sunday suit, and he's marching around my house, and he's demanding equality for everyone.
The Southern Poverty Law Center puts out a report every couple of years that looks at the state of civil rights education in the United States. And every time they do it, it's filled with bad news. We're failing to teach the civil rights movement. We're failing to teach about proper civil disobedience. We're failing to teach about nonviolence. 47 states in the last report are failing to adequately teach the civil rights movement. 47 states. But through March, we're changing that. We've got the graphic novel being used in curriculums in more than 40 states. We've got freshman reading programs at the University of, uh, excuse me, at Michigan State University, at Georgia State University, Marquette University, Henderson State, University of Illinois, and a few that will be announced shortly. Thousands of college kids are reading it. And that's great that they're reading it, but more importantly, they're being inspired to do something about it. I handle social media for the congressman. That's one of my jobs in his congressional staff. I tweet for a living. Right? No, it's fair, right? Ten years ago, y'all didn't know what that was. But the point is, is that social media today, the technology we have, has given us the capability for a generation to organize and mobilize more than any other generation before it. What we have to do is to keep them from being a generation of armchair activists who complain on social media and instead motivate them to show up to make their voice heard. So what we're trying to do is to use these graphic novels to explain the principles. Show them how another generation did it so that they can use this technology, they can use the social media and the internet as we're fighting the net neutrality fight, which by the way, we're getting title too. We're winning. We're protecting the internet, and so that you can use it as a resource to organize and mobilize and tear down the status quo. Now, where do we start? I'm seeing this generation mobilize around the police brutality that is seemingly all too prevalent. And that's a great place to start. We have to resuscitate the activist class. We have to make it possible for you not just to be an activist when you're in school, but to make it a, something that you do after school. When John Lewis marched in Selma, he was 25 years old. He actually missed his graduation when he was 21 because he was in Parchment Penitentiary after having been on the Freedom Rides. So how do we do that? We have to get rid of student loans. Student loans have put this generation in a form of indentured servitude. <laughs> Public education in this country should be free to everyone. <laughs> Let me dramatize this a little bit. When John Lewis, when John Lewis got married in December of 1968, He'd been through the March on Washington. He'd been through Selma. He worked for Robert Kennedy's presidential campaign. He watched two of his mentors be assassinated. When he got married in December of 1968, his wedding announcement read, William Miles to wed unemployed political activist John Lewis. <laughs> People who are ahead of their time pay a price. And we must do away with student loans so that we can free another generation to pay the price that we ourselves have been unable to pay. So before I get a little too political, I'll leave you with this story. When I was a kid, I was told that comic books were not real books. I had a teacher who told me that. Well, I had the opportunity to go back to my high school a couple months ago and have a conversation with that teacher about her experience teaching my book, my graphic novel, with John Lewis. And John Lewis came with me. So if anything, I hope that shows you, not that we need to prove every teacher wrong, 
but that change is possible in large and small ways. And if you believe in something, if you believe in its power, and you work hard, because nobody's saying this is gonna be easy, you can make change happen too. Thank you guys. All right, so we're, we're going to wrap up. Before we leave, I just have a couple of announcements just to let you know. We have questions and answers uh, that will be featured on the MoMagic website. Uh, the other thing I, I, I really just want to share, you, you know, I read both of these books, and they were very powerful. So I hope that everyone out here has an opportunity not just to read these books, but to spread the word and talk about what they've heard and what they've learned it's not often that we have a living legend amongst us to celebrate. Please post this. Thank you, thank you. If you hear a message today that you've appreciated, we would like to see that on your Facebook page. We would like to hear that on Twitter. We want to see that on Instagram, your pictures. We're going to have a book signing immediately afterwards where you'll get an opportunity to have your book signed by Congressman author, civil rights activist, John Lewis, and author, Andrew Iden. Thank you guys so much for your attention. Before you wrap up, I'd like to bring up, as your final presentation and in close, your dean, Kenneth Montero. Change is possible. You were just told change happened, happened again, happened again, and it's still happening because after speaking to us, Congressman Lewis and Mr. Iden go back to work again, making change. I'm here to thank them in uh, just a small way for coming to our campus. Um, you were greeted by the provost who I report to as an administrator and the Associated Students President, who represents those that all of us who are paid a state salary serve. You are here with the students of San Francisco Unified School District, who are our ongoing future. So you're seeing the change here in San Francisco that continues. To paraphrase President Barack Obama, who was extending upon Dr. Martin Luther King, you are the living proof that the arc of history ultimately bends towards justice and has he took a flourish because we must bend it. You've been bending it for years, showing us how to bend it for years, and we have to commit to that same chore. History is not experienced, it is made. I want to give you a small token of appreciation, two of them. One is the crystal with the insignia of the College of Ethnic Studies on it, with the sentiments, Congressman John Lewis honored as a lifelong leader in the civil rights movements, the movements which birthed ethnic studies. And one other small token, and you, you were introduced to the founders of our college who were present here. And there's a gift that the college makes annually that's always quite frugal. We are a state institution. <laughs> but at our annual event, we, we design a gift to designate the founders, and it's only given out as a gift to special friends after the founders have received it. And the founders will, uh, who are here will, will recognize it. It's the relevant education demand, the fist with the unity colors of the multi-ethnic struggle of, led by the Black Student Union Third World Liberation Front on the fist. And I'd like to add that to the gift. And being the youngest child, I'm going to apologize to Mr. Iden. We will have something in the mail to you. 
That's what happens to the youngest child. My sister's out here, she can tell you. You, <laughs> you get it sooner or later, but it's usually sooner. But I want to thank both of you here. The book signing will occur. I want to remind you, book sales directly in the back. Students from uh, San Francisco Unified School District, please stay in place. Your teachers will guide you in terms of what happens next. And before they go to the corner for a book signing, if we could thank them again, like we really know we're at San Francisco State. Thanks, Ken. You done? Right. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Ladies and gentlemen, if we don't know our history, we will not know our success and our future. Thank you all so much for your attention. Have a wonderful afternoon.